On our way to victory, we shall not be moved. We're on our way to victory, we shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the waters, we shall not be moved. On January the 15th, 1968, Martin Luther King celebrated his 39th birthday. It was to be his last. And it says, let me read, it says, we are cooperating with Lyndon Johnson's war on poverty. Drop coins and bills in the cup. And we... <laughs> he did say that he dreamed that he died. He said, I dreamed I died and nobody came to my funeral. Now there's a picture of Dr. King you've seen that he's in deep thought. You've and he that said, and I'm lying there saying, Ralph. Meaning Ralph Abadaffa, his best buddy. Ralph, go call those people. Get those folk to come over here to my funeral. Martin Luther King had always been certain that the civil rights movement would kill him. And shortly after this birthday, in the midst of a new struggle, his prediction would come true. There's a guy named Abby Mann who's a filmmaker who's talking about making a docudrama on King. And Mann says to King, well, how's the story end? And King says, it ends with me being shot. Memphis Police report Reverend Martin Luther King has been shot. Dr. King, 39 years old, Nobel Peace Prize winner, fatally wounded in Memphis as he stood on a hotel Dr. King bomb. came to this city to help settle a garbage workers strike which had been going on for two months here. During the last weeks of his life, Dr. King had come to this city on the banks of the Mississippi River to support garbage collectors. In one of the last great civil rights struggles, the workers had gone on strike after a tragic accident. Well, you didn't have any white workers picking up garbage. The white workers are heavy equipment operators. No whites were picking up garbage, just the blacks. And whenever it rains, the white workers could go inside and get out of the rain. The black workers had to take shelter in the truck. And on this occasion, two men got in the back of a truck to escape the element. And somehow the mechanism of that truck got engaged. Either somebody hit one of the switches or it was a malfunction, and that presser came down on it and crushed him to death. And so the men said, no more. We will work no more. This is about our being willing to face racing, marching, and anything else in order to say no to racism and injustice. We will have a victory. The sign that they carried during the strike it didn't say peace, it didn't say freedom, it didn't say justice. It said, I am a man. It was a hell of a place for Dr. King to end up, a photographer said of his death, and for one hell of a cause, a little garbage strike. But as it turned out, the events in Memphis leading up to Dr. King's death changed the civil rights movement and the way we remember its most famous leader. I just want to do God's will, and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. As a child, I can hear it now. If you don't go to school and learn things, you'll end up being a garbage man. And a garbage man was the worst thing you could be. In early 1968, Memphis garbage collectors were far from Dr. King's vision of the promised land for black Americans. They worked full time for the city, but were paid so little that many still qualified for welfare. Because they couldn't have running water. Cold running, running water. water. No hot water. No hot water. I had eight kids that I was trying to educate, and I called my family, and we sat out and talked about it. They said, well, you, you know, you can't do no worse than you're doing now. Yeah, you can not raise a chicken out of what we were making. That's right. I mean, that salary we were making, you can raise a chicken, woman. No way. For these men who were at the lowest economic level to challenge the system, that's unheard of. You can't do that. Councilman Davis. Aye. Councilman Donaldson. The men walked off the job on the 12th of February, 1968, and marched into city council chambers 10 days later. 
singing, We Shall Not Be Moved, they refused to leave until the predominantly white city council met their demands. But I want you to know one thing. I'm going to bring my little sleep in there. Because if the decision is not right, then by Jingo, I'm not going home anymore. I mean we were pointing at the symbol of the city saying, you've got a cotton bowl on the flag that needs to be ripped off and uh, thrown in the river because that represents slavery. And eventually they were eating salami off the uh, beautiful antique tables. Uh, I think they were getting ready to just about uh, tear the place apart. Prior to this confrontation, Memphis Mayor Henry Loeb had flatly refused to negotiate with the workers because it was against Tennessee law for city employees to strike. Melo was a character that is very hard to describe without becoming offensive. <laughs> he was not only, in my opinion, a segregationist, but he was a pighead. Public employees cannot strike against their employer, and this you can't do. If the law said this, he was a sticker for that, and he had the general white community behind him. I suggested to these men today that you go back to work. The state of Tennessee says public employees could not strike. But also the moral law says that a man who works eight hours a day ought to be given a living wage and his wife and his kids should not be hungry and they should have running water and they should have cleanliness of the house and they should have health care and education. That law is bigger than Tennessee law. So ministers joined forces with the workers. Union officials descended from Washington. They all tried to pressure one of three black city councilors to make a public display that he was on their side. Hold it, hold it, hold it. I will provide. It was a lot of pressure, Fred Davis remembers. And I asked them, do you want a performance or do you want results? Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't force me to not represent you well. Now, I can try to get you results, but... If I put on a performance, I'm going to alienate all of these white councilmen, and I'll never be able to get anything out of them. Davis asked workers to cool off so that he could work behind the scenes to pass a resolution that would meet their demands. The workers, thinking victory was near, called off the sit-in. But the full council had no intention of approving the plan. And the stage was set for the incident that would bring Martin Luther King to Memphis. I think it's been compared to a seething boil that just simply had to be cut open. This was a dilemma for, for this southern town to understand what was going on and to try to do what was right, which was, which was really a denial of the way we had lived all of our lives. While the fate of the Memphis strikers hung in the balance, Martin Luther King was in the middle of a major national project called the Poor People's Campaign. I am the mother with six kids, and part of the time I don't even know where I'm going to get next meal for my children. Dr. King was trying to take the civil rights movement in a new direction. It is easier to integrate a lunch counter than it is to eradicate slum. We had won the battle of being able to have entry into any public place, however, we didn't have the means to utilize them. It's one thing to have the right to go to a restaurant, and another thing not to have the means to pay for a meal. With a plane trip and a public speaking engagement on average nearly every day, Dr. King was busy recruiting people for a massive march on Washington just two months away. Now we want you all to come on to Washington when you get out of school. He no longer felt that joining smaller local struggles was the best use of his time. Dr. King is now getting many invitations to come and help people in a lot of cities and towns. We're rushing to get over to Alabama, and we've enjoyed being in Mississippi today. As a matter of fact, he got so many invitations that once he said, I'm not a fireman, you know, I can't go just, you know, put out, put out every little brush fire. But King was about to change his mind because of Memphis. On February the 23rd, a day after the raucous city council meeting, workers, union leaders, and ministers gathered in Ellis Auditorium, expecting to hear good news. Instead, they were shocked by a resolution that did not meet their demands. The recommendation of our committee... I started to announce the agreement, and I said, five cents an hour raise. And that is far as I got. The place went up in smoke and pandemonium hit and somebody yelled from the balcony, the nigger's gonna sell us for a nickel. It just went crazy. Wait, wait, wait. The men, of course, were just outraged. They were shouting, 
all kinds of slogans. You promised us and you betrayed us. We fell off, you know, because we were ready to get back to work, and this come up and it killed it, put a dap on the whole thing. The men were angry. They demanded that their spokesman be heard. They got up from their seats. Never before in the history would they think that these men who had been so docile now became so vocal, standing on their feet, not asked to be stand. They stood on their own. The workers were instructed to leave the auditorium and organize a march down Main Street. It was a way to vent their frustration. The strike leaders, like Dr. King, were staunch proponents of non-violent demonstrations. We were very peaceful, but then suddenly we had not walked more than a block when squad cars came from everywhere and lined up alongside of us. The strikers had permission to walk on the right side of the road, but a police car kept driving over the line, crowding the demonstrators. I turned around and told the police officers, don't do that. You're trying to provoke us. You all stay on the other side of the line. At first, the police car stopped crossing the line, but when Lawson turned his back, he says it started again. This time, there was chaos. There's been a call of help from other officers. Officers are in trouble. I looked back and I saw the men rocking this car. And instantly, the police officers are pouring out of the cars with cans of mace and macing us. That tear gas is something else. Can't see. Just like somebody would take pepper, pepper water, and spray in your eyes and you had to breathe. And it didn't matter who they were, women, men, clergy with collars on, they maced everybody. Never before in Memphis had the division between blacks and whites been so exposed. At this time, you saw the disintegration of the city. You saw the hatred in people's eyes that just burned a hole right through you. This city is going to hear. This city is going to give us justice. It's just that simple. There will be continued marching. We will not stop. The black community recognized that we were now in a major struggle. The strikers and their supporters immediately started daily marches. As far as they were concerned, the city had raised the stakes by breaking up their first major march. And this is when the call went out to Martin Luther King. I didn't feel good uh, when I heard that Reverend King was coming to Memphis. Make no mistake about it. The general sense in the community in which I live was that Martin Luther King was a troublemaker, that he was disruptive. But when Martin Luther King was invited to come to Memphis, it turned into an event that far exceeded anything I would have imagined at the time. The year-old protest against city buses is officially called off, and the Negro citizens of Montgomery are urged to return to the buses tomorrow morning on a non-segregated basis. I see Martin Luther King lifting the sight of the people. I still have a dream. Instilling a new vision of what it meant to be free. We are saying we ain't going to let nobody turn us around. That's That's right. Right. And yet, I remember once that I think it was Rabbi Heschel who introduced him and talked about him and actually used the word, talked about him as though he were a saint. And Dr. King seemed depressed after that beautiful introduction because you know, he knew he was not a saint and, and wished that he were. We very seldom think that here's a man like us, like other men. Uh, when he first got the call to join the Memphis garbage strike, Martin Luther King understood well that many followers still hoped he could perform miracles. And the expectation weighed heavily on him. I think we very seldom realize the extent to which Dr. King has most of a burden put on his shoulders. The three or four people closest to Martin Luther King realized privately that Dr. King was more stressed out, more depressed than he had ever before been in his life. You know, sometimes he was, you know, walking around in, you know, just sort of a zombie-like state because he hadn't had any sleep, but he couldn't sleep. In the previous summer, Dr. King had seen violence erupt in black ghettos. It was the worst rioting the nation had ever seen. Governor Romney of Michigan and the local officials in Detroit 
have been unable to bring the situation under control. Hundreds were arrested, 30 killed. Many blacks blamed Martin Luther King for not doing enough to help poor blacks living in the cities. Many whites said he'd lost control of the civil rights movement. Dr. King was deeply distressed and struggled with you know, the position that he should take in the light of all of this criticism. And so I'd like to invite Dr. King to bring you words on our Poor People's Campaign in Washington. Now with the Poor People's March, Dr. King was about to gamble that he could attract thousands of supporters to Washington to demonstrate without an outbreak of violence. Thank you very kindly. And some of King's followers were doubtful that he would be able to keep things under control. And uh, power for poor people. Dr. King was really wondering, was the movement over? Had the message been lost? And he needed success to show that he was still a leader and the movement could still function. Meanwhile, in Memphis, the garbage strike continued, and the black community was making little headway with the city's mayor, Henry Loeb. Let no one make a mistake about it. The garbage is going to be picked up in Memphis. If the men do not return to work immediately, we will have no choice but to employ others to protect the public health. The date had been set for Martin Luther King to visit Memphis. Loeb still refused to recognize the strike as a civil rights struggle, and most of the city's white community supported him. Mayor Loeb was very, very big into meeting with the common people. He had open houses maybe twice a week. And, you know, the, the proverbial little old ladies in tennis shoes came down to see him, and he talked to them. He was absolutely convinced he was doing the right thing. And one of the ways he showed us that was he reached and picked up a stack of letters and shook them in our face while we were sitting there to tell us how much support he had. He felt like that he had the pulse of the people. It really didn't seem to react on him that those people were 100% white. With Mayor Loeb standing firm, some workers were losing heart, returning to work at the rate of two or three a day. He told me a number of times that no matter what happened, he would never give in to the union, never. Uh, he thought he'd wear them out. Well, I tell you the truth. When those people started going back, I tell you the truth. I just almost give up on winning. Morrell had begun to get low, and men had started to wondering about things. But when Dr. King came in, we knew that we had him and God on our side. And it is criminal to have people working on a full-time basis and a full-time job getting part-time income. It was March the 18th, 1968, a month into the strike. Dr. King had finally come to Memphis to inspire hope as he had done so many times in the earlier days of the civil rights movement. One day our society will come to respect the sanitation worker if it is to survive for the person who picks up our garbage as in, in the final analysis is as significant as the position for if he doesn't do his job, disease is a rampant. King had planned to give just this one speech in support of the strikers, but then something happened. I want you to imagine these very wide aisles and people were standing shoulder to shoulder. He sensed the unity, he sensed the friendship and the warmth. He sensed that indeed this was one of the movements of the South that he had led in the past. And he was turned on by this mass meeting in Memphis. Dr. King turned to me on stage that night and said, you know, he said, I got a great feeling that this, this is, this is, this is the movement, he says. He said to me, Jim, you are doing in Memphis what I hope to do with the Poor People's Campaign. We had gotten into one of the tough issues, that is, workers who need good work and decency and living wages while they work. He saw Memphis as pulling the movement into the right direction. So it was a watershed movement from his point of view. Through our airplane 
chains, we were able to draw up distance and place time in chains. Through our submarines, we were able to penetrate oceanic depths. Oh, it seems that I can hear the God of the universe saying, even though you've done all of that, I was hungry and you fed me now. At the close of his speech, people were standing, still clapping, and he may have said in his remarks that we should support the striking workers and we should have a, a march. And my goodness, the place just went bonkers when he said that. So I said, would you come back and lead it? And some other people would say, yeah, will you come back and lead it? He said, well, let's work it out. I said, well, announce it, announce it. He said, we're going to have a work stoppage in support of the garbage workers, and I want to come back and lead it. And the police said, ah. That night at the Lorraine Motel, while his staff continued to prepare for the Poor People's Campaign, King talked about his plans for a second visit. After the rally, we went back to the motel, and there was a choir there from college. And when they found out that Dr. King was in the, in the vicinity, they insisted that they had to sing for him because they would probably never get this opportunity in 10,000 years of 1,000 years. And so they came in in their pajamas and in their rollers in their hair and all the things that ladies do in preparation for bed and, and, and sang beautifully. And he, he was quite moved by it. And, and we all thought that was a, a good sign a very good sign. For King, returning to Memphis meant more than helping a local garbage strike. The stakes were much higher. They wanted to use Dr. King to gain publicity for the strike, but King wanted to also use the strike to gain publicity for his movement and to show that he could still lead a movement. King had indicated how after Montgomery, everybody believed that he'd be able to pull a rabbit out of whatever hat someone handed him. That expectation that he could always deliver a victory was a very oppressive burden on King. Dr. King has said he will come to Memphis for the march. We're also serving notice on the city of Memphis that the time for moving hastily towards genuine change is at hand. The march began to move from Claiborne Temple about five minutes till 11 o'clock. The day for King's big march to support the garbage workers began with great movement spirit. His plane was late, but thousands of marchers had been assembling since early morning, as if for a giant street carnival. I wanted to be there early. Because I kept saying, I wanted to be near Dr. King. I wanted to be near Dr. King. I want to be close to Dr. King. Hundreds of people have joined. There must be 5,000 at this time. There were like seas and seas of black people. The first time I marched with the workers, I marched beside a man who had a white sign with black letters that on it that said, I am a man. And then I realized all of his life, he had been boy because white people didn't address black people as men and women. It was, hey, boy. He felt like he was somebody. He felt like he was a man, not a boy. He felt like he was tired of people running over here and you're going to stand up and be a man. Martin Luther King finally joined the march an hour after it was due to begin. People were getting restless. And there was tension between those who wanted a peaceful march and some troublemakers. When I walked to one corner where there was a young man haranguing people, I didn't know him. I'd never seen him before. Obviously an agitator of some kind. I asked him to stop, and I tried to say to him, look, this is to be a nonviolent march. We've invited women and children to be with us. I remember hearing, Dr. King is here, Dr. King is here. Then the adults were saying, stay in line, stay in line. When the march moved off, it was already out of control because there were people standing around, there were people drinking. The police could not control that. They were not even down in that part of the march. They were protecting the property up on Main Street. And then uh, I could hear this sound. It was, a, it was an unusual sound. I didn't know what it was. You can hear them yelling in the background. They're breaking out the store windows. And... We are rolling up now. We're now rolling up our windows. 
windows. They are beginning now to break more windows. My God, I don't know what's happening here. All of a sudden, people start running and screaming. Go back to the church. Go back to the church. Run, run. Now, now it's complete. This order has broken out here. It was just horrible. I actually thought I was going to die. There was a policeman standing near me, and I could hear voices on the radio saying, the Negroes are rioting, the Negroes are rioting. These young thugs took the signs off of the sticks that were holding the signs and started breaking out the windows. As I turn the corner onto Main Street, I see a phalanx of police they have on their helmets. They are in complete battle gear. The police have just been given instructions to break up the march. They waded into the crowd and start beating anybody in sight. I just saw blood, you know, people were just bleeding. And I remember standing there and saying, why? That's not how Dr. King wanted it, because they were looting. They started pulling things out of the stores. This was not supposed to happen. Get off the streets and not assemble that group. Then I say to Martin King, Martin, I want you to leave because I'm turning the march around. And he immediately protests and said, people will say I'm a coward and I'm running away. And I said, I, I recognize that. But I said, I'm stopping the march and turning it back. Get out of the street. Martin Luther King is getting into an automobile. Martin Luther King has left the march. The fellows who were around Martin had to pick him up bodily to take him to the Rivermont Hotel, which had just recently been integrated. And I went over there, and he was lying in bed, not, not in pajamas, but just lying on the bed in his clothes. And he was so despondent, and he was just, he said, what do you think happened? What happened? What happened? And of course, we did ask for the National Guard at 11.32 this morning. There will be 4,000 troops in this city by 6 p.m., 250 Tennessee. I didn't Island think it would get this far. And I can remember clearly feeling that the day I stood in the showroom of my automobile dealership, looking out to Union Avenue and seeing trucks go by with tanks on them. The day after the disastrous march was one of the lowest moments in Dr. King's career. Dr. King has been criticized for coming in from outside and then abandoning the march when the going got rough. What's your reaction to that? There was severe criticism of Martin King. It was said that we caused the riot. That was what was said. We did not run, as the Memphis paper said. We walked very slowly. And as I walked, I was agonizing over what had developed. When the march degenerated into a riot, abandoned by its leaders, the police, with my full sanction, took the necessary action to restore law and order. It was said this is the last gasp of a nonviolent movement. Dr. King, can you or will you guarantee that there will be no violence during your next march in Memphis? I am convinced that we can have here and in Washington a massive nonviolent campaign. After March 28th, which in his mind was the greatest public disaster that had ever befallen his reputation, King knows that he has to pull off a success. That pressure was perhaps as great as it might ever have been in his life. With Memphis in shambles, the Poor People's Campaign was in jeopardy. If King could not lead a peaceful demonstration in Memphis, could he lead one in Washington? Back with his staff, King debated whether to lead another Memphis march. Some staff members thought Memphis was political quicksand. The first thing they say, I want to be in Washington. But I said to them that, really, you can't go to Washington but by Memphis. Because if we cannot have a peaceful march in Memphis, they make a case that you're not going to have it in Washington. But don't let that thing go too fast on you. He sat there all this time listening to the staff arguing so violently the pros and cons, and everybody holding on to their position. His staff said, we don't really have time because we're, we're running behind schedule with the Poor People's Campaign, and we just don't have time to do it. And he overruled the staff. He said, no. He said, this is what the Poor People's Campaign's about, poor working people. He said, we're going to come back to Memphis, and we're going to have a peaceful march. We're going to do that. 
April 3, 1968. Despite tornado warnings, 2,000 people still turned out to hear Martin Luther King speak. I shan't forget, it will be itched in my memory for all the years to come, the clouds came in and the, uh, the weather, it was if somehow the providence was against us. <laughs> When King had arrived for this third and final trip to Memphis, he was tired. At first, he decided to stay behind at the Lorraine Motel, and he sent Ralph Abernathy to Mason Temple to give the main speech in his place. He said, you guys go over and have the rally. I'll stay here and work on the Poor People's Campaign. When we walked in, Ralph's preacher sense said, wait a minute, these people are not clapping for us. They think Martin's behind us. He said, I ain't making no speech tonight. And so he went to the phone and called Martin and said, man, you better get over here. These people came out in the weather to see you, and you need to get over here. He said, well, if you think I need to come, I'll come. But we almost missed the mountaintop speech. And so the evening began in earnest with a 25-minute introduction of King by Ralph Abernathy. And sometimes we ought to stop and introduce a man properly. Martin Luther King was born in Atlanta, Georgia. Black audiences know how to move a speaker on, and they didn't do that to Ralph. Usually they would say, amen, amen, brother. That means get out of the way. Never said it. The wind was blowing the shutters in the temple, and every time they would bang, he would jump and look around, Martin would, and they would say, bam, and I noticed that it was making him really nervous, so I got the janitor to turn the fans on so the shutters would blow out, so they wouldn't bang. The Moses of 1968, Martin Luther King. Finally, it was King's turn to speak. He took no script to the podium. You know, several years ago, I was in New York City autographing the first book that I had written. While sitting there autographing book, the minute black woman came up, before I knew it, I had been stabbed by this demented woman. It came out in the New York Times the next morning that if I had merely sneezed, I would have died. He preached the fear out of him of death. He worked it out. That whole speech was about getting death behind him. Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter with me now. Because I've been to the mountaintop. I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live... A long life, longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But I want you to know the night that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. We were just standing there crying. We didn't know why we were crying. I mean, we just, we just stood there and looked at each other. So, oh my God. I know people speculated afterwards. Did he sense that he had done all that he was called to do? And some of us believe that perhaps he had, had done all he was called to do. I may not get there with you, but I have been to the mountaintop. I've seen the promised land, but my people, and my people will get to the promised land. Ooh. 
We're on our way to victory. We shall not be moved. We're on our way to victory. We shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the waters. We shall not be moved. In their brief journey together, the garbage workers had struggled to tell the world that they were men. Dr. King had struggled to remind others he was only a man. Now the journey was to come to an end. The night after King's speech, at the Lorraine Motel, he dressed for dinner. Martin asked me in the room while we were preparing to go why I thought the, uh, the old movement spirit had come to Memphis, come back to Memphis. And I said, I think people really identify with the, with, the, with the garbage workers. And it was a very relaxed time. He, he, had, he had really come out of that depression. And, and he preached the fear out of him of death the night before. And he was just in a very light mood. So we walked on the balcony. Martin here and I'm here. And he was greeting people he had not seen in the courtyard. And I walked about five steps. And the shot rang out. Fire! And I ran to him. And it was like a nightmare. I was trying to wake up, but I was already awake. It was like I was shaking my head. This, 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 this gaping hole. The necktie that I picked out for him after he put his other shirt on, the impact of the bullet severed the knot and turned it upside down. And I don't know why I remembered that, but it's etched in my mind. I ran in the room and picked up the phone. And I couldn't get the operator, so I was saying, answer the phone, answer the phone, answer the phone. I was out taking driver's education, and we were sitting in class, and uh, there was another trooper that came in the class and beckoned the state trooper that was teaching the class to come here. And when he said something to him, this trooper just turned totally red. He had such a fear on his face. I mean, it was like he, you know, so he came to the front of the class. And he said, class is dismissed. Dr. King has been shot. I didn't believe it. I thought it was not possible. I arrived and uh, at the office and people were having uh, hysterics. Dr. King's been shot. Dr. King's been shot. Dr. King is dead, someone even said to me. I said, don't be ridiculous. I said, it's the most ridiculous rumor I've ever heard. Please stop. I'm sorry that anybody gets uh, killed. Uh, I don't. I'm not any. Was not any sorry that uh, you know the, the one thing that happened. That I was sorry it happened in Memphis. Uh, I knew that Memphis now would uh, have the Dallas uh, syndrome, where oh, yeah, that's where they killed King. And it just looked like the end of the world had come. It sure did. I've been in the storm so long. Oh, let me tell you, sister, just how I come along. Give me a little time to pray with a hung down head and an aching heart. Lord, give me a little time to pray. The day after King's assassination, more than 300 religious leaders went to the mayor's office to say enough is enough. It was time to settle the strike. So I called Henry and said, Henry, we're coming. And he said, you're going to get in trouble. I said, there's no way, Henry, that I can stop them from coming. That day, Loeb's phone was never silent. His office never empty. The same people who had asked him to stand his ground told him to abandon the ground. And the basic tone was, Henry, settle it. I don't care what you do, but this has gone too far. I think that some of his best friends had called and said, now look what you've done. You've ruined the city. You've uh, caused a calamity. 
uh, you killed, uh, you know, the, the blacks, uh, Messiah, and uh, he was uh, stricken. If we had been able to get a hearing as ministers of the black community, we never would have needed to send for King or anybody else. Mayor Loeb, in opening the meeting, he asked me to offer a prayer. I said, you're the man who caused his death. <laughs> you know, to me, you are the man. I said, Mayor, I'm sorry, I just, I can't pray in this occasion. In the wake of Dr. King's death, Memphis couldn't avoid the national spotlight. Even President Johnson got involved in the local strike. He sent a negotiator from the Labor Department to help iron out an agreement between the garbage workers and the city. This labor dispute is like a tiny pebble dropped in a calm pool and the rings that are created have gone out and out and out and have created fantastic problems throughout our nation and they all begin here. Many years after we went through this ordeal and people came at me with difficult things, I would laugh them off and say, you know, you can't phase me. I've been through the sanitation strike. So, uh, <laughs> make your best shot. <laughs> Let it be known by saying I. It was April the 16th, and the workers gathered one more time to consider an agreement. They voted overwhelmingly to end the strike. And every worker knew at what cost. If Dr. King hadn't got killed, I don't believe we would have made it. Because those people was crossing the line so fast, and I think that's what done it. It's bad to say that it happened, but I still said if he hadn't got killed, I don't think we'd have made it. I really don't. The sanitation strike in Memphis was where Memphis was catapulted into a new age and a new day for the life of this city. We can no longer go back and live the way we once did, and some of that is frightening, but nevertheless, we must persevere. The strike had lasted 64 days. Martin Luther King had been killed. But Memphis had finally said to every one of its garbage collectors, you are a man. And early the next morning, they went back to work. Because I've been to the mountain top. There had to be witness to that crucifixion. And so my witness is that Martin Luther King Jr. didn't die in some foolish way. But he died, gave his life, helping garbage work.